Two years ago, I got a phone call from Nickelodeon. They were going to relaunch the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cartoon. So they called me up and they're like, hey, Paul, we're wondering if you can help us with a promotional event. We're going to give away Xboxes, but we want them to be themed out as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So we're thinking what you could do is do like a sticker with a bunch of different characters on it that we'd wrap around the Xbox. But you see, I'm Santa for nerds. So I told them, yeah, we could do that. But what if you could have anything? What if the sky was the limit? And so they took that idea back to the art department at Nickelodeon, and they had a field day. They loved the idea to be able to go back to being a child where there were no restrictions because they knew they had somebody in the middle of Nebraska in a workshop who could create anything. So they, we settled on five different designs, the first one being turtle shells. One turtle for each of the different turtles that were in the show. And the cool thing about it is that they were uh, illuminated from the inside using the color that represented the turtle. The second one that we had was their arch nemesis shredder, bursting out of a brick wall with the bricks flying off of the front of it. And then on the back of it, we actually had a graffiti symbol that says no to the Foot Clan. The third box that we created was the turtle van. And this thing was huge, it was over two feet long. It hid an Xbox on the inside of it, but it was also, you could open it up and play with your toys from the 80s inside of it. Now my favorite box was the fourth one, which we called the Eastman box. You see, Kevin Eastman was the original artist for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and he created black and white graphic novels of the, of the, sh the turtles. And so what I did is I took those black and white panels and I created three-dimensional reliefs on every side of the Xbox. You know, all of them showing off in their, in their finest. And then lastly, we created this piece. You see, back in the 80s, arcades were all the, the hit, and one of the best four-player arcades that you could play was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool, or totally awesome, if we actually created a, a reproduction of that arcade that you could actually play using an Xbox controller, but it hid a real Xbox inside. Now, when you're Santa for nerds and you allow artists to fully stretch their wings, the, re the reception becomes much bigger. When I unlocked this ability within Nickelodeon, we saw a tenfold reaction from the fans. They entered this contest so much because they all wanted to get their hands on one of these custom pieces. So, my world is filled with magic. That's the joy of Santa. I make the things that people want that they can't find anywhere else. I'm known for creating something from nothing. And I do it in my studio here. That's the nerd wall that you see behind me. So one of my favorite properties that I love working with is Harry Potter. And the reason that is is because in the world of Harry Potter, magic is in our real world. Now I grew up reading those books like many of you did. And there are so many elements in it that are endearing and surprising but live in a realistic world. Now, when working with customers, one of the things that I make a lot of are custom engagement ring boxes. And this is the object that holds the ring when you propose. And when I introduce the idea of being able to create a nerddom into any of your proposals, then people started asking for all sorts of things. And one of the things that they asked for was Harry Potter. One of the very first ring boxes that I created was the sorting hat. This is the hat that would uh, put you into your different houses. Now, the cool thing about my pieces is that I make hidden ring boxes. The idea is that when you give the gift to somebody, they're just seeing the object. Because who wouldn't want a really cool collectible that looked like the thing from your favorite nerddom? But then, hidden inside is the ring. And now the cushion that the ring is actually in is usually colored to represent the house that you've been sorted in. Now one of my favorite pieces that I've worked on for Harry Potter is the golden snitch. And the golden snitch in the books is what Harry, as a seeker, has to catch to win the game of Quidditch. And the very first uh, snitch that he caught, his mentor Dumbledore hid the Philosopher's Stone inside. And that Philosopher's Stone would allow Harry to live forever. So I thought, what a perfect representation of a proposal. 
So anybody, any fan of Harry Potter would love to get their own golden snitch. But then what if inside, inside is a ring, and that ring holds a stone, and that stone represents a love that will last forever. Now, I've made lots of different pieces for Harry Potter uh, and because I love to put that magic into it. One of the pieces being the pence, uh, this is the Mirror of Erised. And in that one, you can see the thing that you desire most in your life. In this case, it would be the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. I also created the pensive in which you can pull those memories out of your mind. A little spring action going on there. So you can pull the, the memories out and you can store them forever. What a perfect way of capturing that moment, of making that moment tangible. Now, another thing that I love to do is I love to incorporate magic into all of my pieces. So on some of the ring boxes, I'll actually create a little wand and they just wave it in front of the piece and it magically opens without interaction with human beings. And then it shows the ring and the proposal and the house that's inside of it. And I've done this one many times and it's always such a joy for the person who's receiving it. So working within different nerddoms, um, I found that fans love what they love. And one of the most popular nerddoms is Star Wars. But the problem with Star Wars is that it takes place in a galaxy far, far away. So how do we take us here on planet Earth and put us into the world of Star Wars? And it was a really hard one because their lore and their fans are very particular about their lore. They don't want it to change. So I thought, how can we do this? How can we, ah, I got an idea. So one day I was in the shower, which is where all great ideas come from, right? <laughs> and I thought, what if we freeze you, you, in carbonite, like a certain smuggler who did the run in what, 4.3 parsecs? Okay, so here we have you, frozen in carbonite. And the cool thing about it is that it can be you in any outfit, in any pose. I make these for couples. I make these for friend groups. And the trays get larger and larger. You can have yourself frozen forever in the world of Star Wars. Now this was such a cool idea. It came out right around Christmas time. And I sold about five or 600 of these pieces. And, uh, you can see some of them here. And what was really neat is about six months later, Disney opened one of their Star Wars attractions. And in that attraction, you could have your face 3D scanned and plunked on the body of Han Solo, essentially freezing you in carbonite. And they did a soft open for their super fans. But the problem was is they hadn't done enough of the pieces to be able to fully advertise it. So they said, hey, Paul, we see you've been doing this. Is there any way that we can use your images of all of these fans frozen in carbonite so that we can advertise this thing that we're doing? And of course I said yes, because who turns down the mouse? So, so they used this piece and it ended up being uh, a, a huge success for the fans. Now, fortunately they've discontinued doing that part here, so I still get to make more. Okay. <laughs> but not all fandoms uh, or per pieces that are purchased come from a sense, of, a place of happiness, a place of joy, a place of this is the thing that I need in my life. 15 years ago, I received an email, how like Santa receives his letters. And I said, dear Paul, I'm a father and my daughter loves Beauty and the Beast. And she would love nothing more than to be able to hold the floating rose from Beauty and the Beast. Unfortunately, my daughter is fighting against cancer and she doesn't have much time left. And we would love to have her hold this before we lose her. Is there any way that Santa can help? <laughs> and so I created this floating rose and we got it to them. And the way the father described it is just like the curse of the beast the petals, when they fall off the rose, when they finally all fall off, the beast can no longer find love. He's trapped as a beast forever. But as long as there are petals on the rose, he has the ability to be loved. And they wanted their daughter to know that she will always be loved. And I got it to him just in time. I'm a father of three myself. And this is a story that always resonates with me because I can't imagine that and to be able to be somebody from somewhere far away, to be able to give somebody that symbol that represents love, it meant so much to me. 
And that's the joy of being Santa, of being able to put love, magic, back out into the world. But the thing is that I never set out to be Santa. I was just an artist who wanted to put my heart into the pieces and bring joy to other people. And it wasn't that I set out to make pieces for every single person in the world. I wanted to give one to you, and one to you, and to you. One person at a time, giving them magic, giving them love. And we can all do it, each and every one of you. Find it in yourself to put the magic back into the world that you want to see in it. Give that love to one other person and watch how it travels the world. Thank you.